Welcome to the Richard Roper podcast on this very special edition of the podcast. Nobody ever says this not quite particularly special or ordinary edition of the podcast, but we do have a theme here. We're going to talk about uh, the fallout from various uh, stories and now the fallout from the fallout. And we're not talking about the series Fallout, which you should check out. And if you go to suntimes.com, you can get my review of Fallout, all of my written reviews there. But we're here to talk about the podcast. And of course, before we get into everything, here's your reminder. The Richard Roper Show is brought to you by AmericanEagle.com Studios. The digital landscape is changing rapidly. And to compete in today's online business environment, you need an experienced partner. Since 1995, AmericanEagle.com has partnered with companies of all sizes, offering web design web development, e-commerce, mobile apps, and digital marketing. This is all to drive your overall business's success because, of course, they believe that today's online world is your online opportunity. Visit AmericanEagle.com to get started today. That's AmericanEagle.com, AmericanEagle.com. Thanks to all my friends there, my producer, Brian, my buddies, Tony and Mike and everybody at AmericanEagle.com, uh, Renee, all of you, thank you so much for all of your support uh, through the years. Okay, bunch of stuff going on in the world as usual. You know, we've talked about this a little bit before. When I started this podcast, it was originally with my uh, old uh, radio partner, Rokan. Not that he's old, my ex radio partner and current still great friend, Rokan. We just had dinner the other day and we called it Screen Time because we wanted it to be about anything that you'd see on the screen, small or big, movies, TV, news shows you name it and we're really going to be talking about different things that are getting a lot of screen time recently including oh man, christy gnome uh you know her you know him and you know all about him christy gnome of course uh has the new book coming out it's finally out now uh and uh, you know it's all about her political career and it's quite obvious that she wants to be the donald's uh vp running mate for the upcoming election uh the, the book for, I, listen i'm not gonna read the book i'm not gonna lie to you i'm not gonna read the book i've read some of the excerpts and of course we've seen the fallout from it because there are two things that everybody's talking about from christy gnome's book uh the fact that she talks about uh basically facing down kim jong-un and she even uh in the audio book uh, reads her own words about meeting uh, Kim Jong Un. It turns out she hasn't, and as she's being asked about this, she's like, "Oh, we're, you know, we're going to rectify this mistake." Listen, I've made numerous mistakes in reviews and articles and books over the years. It happens. You get you, even with the great copy editors that I've had a pleasure the pleasure of working with through the years. I've got great editors right now at the Sun Times, and producers and radio and TV and you know things get through. And I think we're pretty forgiving people, especially if there's not bad intent. When people make factual errors, I've, I've gotten the names of people wrong occasionally or missed up, uh, messed up and missed up on historical facts. And you, you correct it. You apologize it. You apologize for it. You can apologize it. Hey, apologize it, man. Uh, and, you know, honestly, one of the advantages now of the fact that we live in this uh, digital world is listen when it's committed to mit to print it's there and you still you still apologize for it and you and you make the correction but you can then correct it for the record in an online review in any case christy no she's she keeps talking about how you know yeah this meeting didn't take place but these things happen and she's not going to get into the details of meetings she's had with world leaders even though she's already written about it in her book uh far more egregious and getting far more attention of course is the whole story about her uh, killing her dog saying that the dog was a menace the dog was killing the chickens and terrorizing the kids and she she put down the dog uh and uh, listen people that know far more about these types of dogs about dogs on farms uh, many 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 from all sides of the political spectrum have, have stepped forward to say there are other ways to deal with a dog like this a puppy still i think it was just over a year old that that is you know yeah uh, a lot of trouble but there are other ways of dealing with this and she almost seems to take this joy in doubling down on the killing of the dog she's saying that uh what's the name of the dog commander joe biden's dog that's been a problem should probably be put down but the weird thing is and this is a strange thing that we've seen more in this generation of politicians on both sides uh 
than I ever saw when I was coming up anyway. And listen, there was always this kind of, you know, doubling down on the misleading statements. Remember Bill Clinton famously said, I did not have sex with that woman, Monica Lewinsky. That's my Bill Clinton impersonation from the nineties. Uh, because he can, cons- I don't know. That was his way of getting around the fact that there was sexual contact, but not actual intercourse. So this is nothing completely new, but She's now taking this attitude like the fake news is twisting the story that, again, she wrote about killing her dog. And then in interviews, she's getting all upset, saying, listen, I've answered these questions about uh, these mistakes. And in this case, the killing of this dog. And why do you treat me differently from everybody? Let's listen to this one uh, interview here with Christine. I will definitely ask him about his record, but I'm asking you about your book here which we have I'm just asking for why so why am i being treated differently than every other person that you've interviewed i've looked at your last I'm several weeks in you. your interviews you don't you don't interrupt other people you let them talk thank you for inviting me to have this conversation about this book this book is extremely uh, important to the people of this country it is important because it's a how-to guide of what they can do to have input into their government how we need breakers and builders in this world. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm taking responsibility for the change that we've made. uh, Okay, and And for the mistake in the book. And I've told you that, and I'm, uh, no, it's not. What I've said is that I have decided- You're not taking responsibility for the mistakes in the book. I've decided this, and I'm saying that this book is uh, very, very good, and I've met with many world leaders, and that um, there are world leaders that I've met with that are in this book. There are many that I've met with that are not in this book. Okay. Uh, and this is an anecdote uh, that that I asked to have re- removed because I think it's appropriate at this point in time. But I'm not going to talk to you about those personal meetings that I've had with world leaders. OK, I'm just not going to have that conversation because I think it's important. It's so strange that she's now uh, trying to play the victim. And I would say this, that I have rarely seen such a poor job of damage control that I've seen by Christy Noem in the last week, every single tele- television interview, all these tweets. Here's another one. And I, and I, I know we're not we're trying to stay away from pure politics on the podcast because we're here to mostly talk about entertainment, but this is television and it is all about the current state of our, our media world. Uh, and Christy Noem, I, I have just the, the idea here that she tweeted this is true that she tweeted that uh most politicians just pretend to be regular americans but donald trump is the real thing he's a regular guy is what she basically tweeted and i don't care if you're the biggest donald trump supporter in the world i think if you are even you would admit that the last thing that donald trump is is a regular american he has spent his entire life even before he was in the public eye and he was going to, you know, exclusive schools and using his privilege and, and working his way up with the help of millions of dollars given to him by his father. He's always positioned himself as an elite, as better than everybody else. And the, you know, yeah, he'll do the shit where he brings a couple of pizzas to fire department guys and, and, you know, throws paper towels to flood survivors, but that's such, it's such bullshit. And I think even Donald Trump, he doesn't want to hang around with regular people. He's not trying to be a regular American. I mean, that that's how either delusional or cynical Christy Nome is maybe both. Now let's move on to some more fallout, uh, material. Uh, people are still talking about the roast of Tom Brady that occurred. It's a, it's a three hour Netflix show. Cause they ran it live. You know, we usually, when you see like the comedy central roasts, uh, which are the most famous of this generation. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of roasts in a second. But usually when you see those like Comedy Central roasts and other channels that have done stuff like that, networks, it's heavily edited. They take a three or four hour program. They distill it to an hour of the best stuff. Part of it is because of technical stuff. You know, there's moving around of cameras and there's breaks and stuff. But part of it is also because not every routine works. And sometimes a 15 minute routine works a lot better if it's brought down to maybe three minutes. Uh, and occasionally there have been instances where somebody said, you know, let's not air that joke. It, 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 it even for a roast uh, goes beyond uh, the limits, but this was shown live. Uh, Kevin Hart was kind of the host, Jeffrey Ross, the great roast master. Um, the roasts go back uh, like a hundred years. I'm sure there were roasts even before that, you know, in the Mel Brooks history of the world. I'm sure there was. 
Uh, but the Friars Club is the famous New York club, right, where you have to be a member and all these old school comics would do these roasts going back to the 50s and 60s. And then in the 70s, 70s and 80s, they had the Dean Martin Celebrity Roast, which was on NBC, kind of a regular show. They were specials, but they occurred like, you know, I think there were 50 or 55 total. of them. They were done at the Friars Club and it was very old school. So you'd have everybody from like, you know, Comics of the day from the 70s, we're talking about Nipsey Russell and Don Rickles and Norm Crosby and that whole bunch. And then even old time Hollywood stars, Bob Hope and Lucille Ball. And you'd see Jimmy Stewart and Orson Welles uh, and, and, and athletes like Joe Namath, who was kind of, you know, very, very famous beyond just sports back in his day and was making the transition into show business. Let's play a little audio from a long ago Dean Martin celebrity roast. We're roasting Don Rickles. Rickles is the man about whom Adolf Hitler once said, from him I could learn. <laughs> Don's idea of a fun evening is to show home movies of the attack on Pearl Harbor <laughs> with a laugh track. <laughs> And of course, if you go on YouTube, you can find a lot of this stuff. Don Rickles in particular, you know, is a legend. I love Don Rickles. But when you go back and of course, so much of his humor was based on race and ethnicity and misogyny and, and, you know, a lot of it just wouldn't play today, but it's interesting to see. So now let's fast forward to the last, you know, 15, 20 years. Uh, Comedy Central, as I mentioned, they've had all these great roasts and they've got, you know, Justin Bieber and Bob Lowe. Um, the Alec Baldwin roast, I think is one of the most famous ones because he, first of all, he's a guy that just, you know, sets him up. There's so much great material there. I remember when uh, his daughter, Ireland, actually Ireland, uh, roasted him and she was hilarious. And, and by, by the way, sidebar, if you're not a professional comedian, even if you are, there's a team of writers that work on these for you. That's why sometimes you'll see somebody who's not a professional comedian and you're like, wow, they're really funny. Well, they do a good job of delivering the lines, but yeah, there, there are staffs of writers who put together these jokes. So the Comedy Central, and you know, the thing about the roast is it's supposed to be all bets are off. They're supposed to be wildly politically incorrect, even in this day and age. They're going to go after your personal life. They're going to make, you know, jokes that, again, uh, skirt the boundaries and then sometimes cross the boundaries of taste. So if it's Rob Lowe, they go after him or, you know, some transgressions way in the past. If it's Alec Baldwin, they're going to go after his infamous temper if it's somebody who's had a drinking or drug problem, you know, the idea is no bets are off. And in the case of the Comedy Central Roast, it's usually a fundraiser for the Roasties' favorite charity. I think they're great. Again, you, you know, every once in a while, you know, you'll see somebody. Uh, Ann Coulter was, I think it was the Rob Lowe Roast, right? Ann Coulter, I don't know why they invited her other than, like, to make her uncomfortable. And I'm not a fan at all. But, you know, they just tore into her. And then she tried to come back and it, she was out of her league, you know, again, I'm not a fan at all. And I'm, you know, quite nauseated by many of the positions that Ann Coulter's taken over the year, but she's a skilled debater in her own uh, comfort zone. So when you used to see her on the, on the cable news programs, or I'm sure she's still doing, I don't know, speeches and podcasts and all that shit. Uh, you know, she, she came armed with ammunition, even though her arguments were often uh, despicable, but in the comedy roast, arena she was in a hostile environment not only was she being attacked by people who do it you know professionally but the audience wasn't on her side either when she did her routine neither were the celebrities who were there so a lot of them were thinking like what the hell is she doing here so brutal brutal stuff um on the other hand somebody like martha stewart is actually great at these roasts because she's got this incredible sense of humor about her own you know problems and foibles in, in history and it's just really funny so now we fast forward to uh, this Tom Brady roast, which I, you know, honestly, I had heard, a ton, I had not heard a ton about it before uh, the, until the days leading up to it. It was in this, you know, the, this giant arena where the Lakers used to play, which is kind of weird too, because the roasts are usually not in small arenas, but more intimate because of, you know, comedy. Although a lot of people are doing stadium and arena comedy roasting is usually done better, you know, kind of in a closed claustrophobic environment. And I don't know, somebody can, I, I looked this up. I couldn't find anything. I don't know where the proceeds were going from this. It seemed to be from what I've been told that Tom Brady thought it would be the coolest thing to be roast, that he was a fan of these things. And again, you know, you think, oh, Tom Brady, perfect life, but not because like everybody else, he's a human being. He's had, you know, a couple of uh, 
high profile romances, including this recent divorce from Giselle that went sideways. Uh, you know, various little mini scandals. We just saw in that great uh, New England Patriots uh, documentary, you know, Deflate Gate and his run ins with Belichick and uh, other things like that. And this kind of perfect image, you know, he seems to have it all and he does have it all, but there's, there's definitely material there. So there was, you know, th- some of the stuff in the, in the roast was great. And as usual, what happens with these roasts is comic goes up there or whoever it is, former teammates of Brady, whatever the case may be. And before they go after Tom Brady, you know, they, they go after other members on the panel. Gronk got hit with a lot of, you know, shrapnel, uh, most of it playing on him, maybe not being the most brilliant mind of his generation. And he seemed to be a pretty good sport about it, but other people as well. And Kevin Hart took, you know, a lot of, a lot of the short jokes. Nikki Glazer, I thought was the highlight. People have talked a lot about Nikki. Um, I've, I've been a fan of her work for a long time. She actually did. This is kind of inside. If you're not a Howard Stern fan, they actually did a, a roast once of Ronnie, the limo driver, Ronnie Mond. Yay, Ronnie. Uh, and she roasted, you know, various staff members and, and it was perfect. You know, she was clearly that she's a huge fan of the show and addition to being a great guest. And in fact, she was on Howard's show on Monday talking about some of the jokes she didn't get in uh, from Sunday night. Um, let's take a listen. Why don't we listen to just a little bit of Nikki Glazer from the roast of Tom Brady? Why not? the best to ever play for too long. I mean, you were tired, then you came back, and then you were tired again. I mean, I get it. It's hard to walk away from something that's not your pregnant girlfriend. It's tough. (laughs) Hey, to be fair, he didn't know she was pregnant. He just thought she was getting fat. (laughs) And Tom hates fat. I mean, do you guys know about his diet program? It is so strict, but if you follow it exactly as he does, you too can lose your family. So as we say, we, you know, for the podcast today, we're talking about the fallout from the fallouts. And, you know, there was some talk about how Tom Brady, you know, he was upset about a joke about Robert Kraft and told Jeffrey Ross to knock it off. Jeffrey Ross saying that was kind of a bit. It wasn't really, it looked like he might've been really mad, you know, making a joke about Robert Kraft and the whole massage thing. And people were pointing up, but he wasn't upset about the jokes about his kids or his ex-wife or his personal life. And now uh, People Magazine is reporting that um giselle is actually upset and deeply disappointed by the roast this is from people magazine she's disappointed by the jokes made regarding her previous marriage to tom brady by the way not him making them but being made by them um her priority the source says is to support her children they were affected by the irresponsible content that was broadcast uh there you know we mentioned kevin hart julian edelman rob gronkowski nikki glazer drew bledsoe randy moss kim kardashian among others there was a lot of um a lot of the same jokes about giselle supposedly having this affair with the jujitsu instructor right and how that you know tom why would you suggest to your wife that she should take jujitsu and this guy could do this to giselle while doing that to tom at the same time yeah they were it was rough stuff but again it's a roast and I don't know if Giselle's really upset or, or not, but I'm I'm sure she's thinking what a lot of us are thinking is, why did Tom Brady want to do this? We already know that he can laugh at himself, right? I guess. He has all the money in the world. He can do anything he wants, and he's doing it, you know, whether it's his promoting his line of fitness products and his brand, TB12, doing the TV analyst thing. He could, I'm, I think at some point he'll probably become, he'll go to the Magic Johnson route too and be like an owner or part owner of a franchise like Derek Jeter. He's never going to be a, a coach because that's not enough power for him. So he can do anything he wants and he subjects himself to this roast. I'll never get it. Why people would want to do that. Okay. One last thing before we take a break about the fallout from the fallout, they have that Met Gala, you know, the Met Gala, right? It's for the, what's it called? The Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art. Is that the Met in uh, New York? And that's the one where all the celebrities wear the craziest outfits. And we saw that footage of like, you know, these dresses that are so elaborate and complicated that people literally have to pick up the person wearing the dress or surround her and do all the, and it, you know, it, yes, it's lavish and it's excessive and it could be socially tone deaf, but I mean, it's been around for a long time. I think most of us like to look at it with a sense of humor. Uh, you know, I always have the same questions every year about the Met Gala. Once they get inside, I know there's a there's usually a performance by some big stars. There's a dinner. Uh, my question is, do they? How could they possibly sit in some of those outfits? There's no way you could actually sit, and your dress would go back like ten, you know, tables deep. And of course, what do you do when you have to go to the bathroom? 
do the women just not go? Do they have uh, some sort of lining in these designer outfits? Because they don't allow pictures. Once in a while, someone will take, you know, send an Instagram or something from a uh, bathroom. But I, I don't understand what's going on there. Business Insider did have some information because they thought they really kind of kept the, the, the clamps on this in terms of no footage allowed inside. Uh, individual tickets cost $75,000. Entire tables cost $350,000. That's for cocktail hour, dinner. Well, that's not a cash bar. Jeez. And those exclusive performances. And of course, it's all about the clout. You know, if you got invited, that means you're a big deal uh time magazine uh recorded yeah that uh, has reported that like i said the tickets had gone up uh they're usually purchased by design houses and brands and companies and putting their people there so uh, just uh, celebrities you got people that you know it, it behooves them to be in the company of these folks um the seating chart is a big deal all of that stuff there was a time where you know they mentioned even kip kardashian couldn't get an invite but now she does uh all of this by the way benefits the costume institute and you may ask what is the costume institute I have an answer for you. It, it's the actual, it's the museum's costume institute. It's more than 33,000 objects representing seven centuries of fashionable dress and accessories for men, women, and women and children. So it goes all the way back to the 15th century. And I'm sure it's pretty fascinating, but it's not exactly, and maybe there's, maybe there's a piece of this that goes to other charities, but that's what it's benefiting. The costume institute, all that money going to the, that is, must be one hell of a costume institute. I, you know, it's ridiculous. I think I think most people take it with a grain of salt. Some people are offended by it, and some people analyze the various fashion choices. Uh, I don't want to go to the Met. I never want to be roasted, and I'm not buying Chrissy Gnome's book. All right, let's talk about Portillo's, and then we come back. We're going to have a couple of reviews for you. All right, let's talk about Portillo's. Now, they, of course, are known for their famous Chicago hot dogs with all the freshest and tastiest ingredients, right down to that poppy seed bun. And then, of course, there's the legendary chocolate cake. If you're hearing this right now, that means you are alive and near a computer. That's all you got to be. That's all you need to go to Portillo's.com and check out their entire selection of stuff you can get anywhere in these United States of America. Now, if you're blessed enough to live near a Portillo's, then you don't have to worry about getting online. Just go to the store, get the hot dogs, get the Italian beef, the salads, the chicken. They got it great. And then, of course, the chocolate cake, the single greatest item of all chocolate cake items in the history of humanity. You think I'm overstating that? I am not. Go and find out yourself. Go to the store, order online. Unbelievable, the chocolate cake. And they even have a cake shake. They take the cake, they smoosh it into a can with some super cool ingredients. I don't know, they do a bunch of stuff. There's ice cream, and all of a sudden you got a chocolate cake shake. When it comes out of the blender, it's the best. It is a unique dining experience every time. Go to portillos.com. Find a location near you. You can order online. P-O-R-T-I-L-L-O-S. Portillos.com. Okay, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. This is the 10th Planet of the Apes movie we have had, my friends. Uh, the original Planet of the Apes, I believe, was a 19, I want to say 1963 novel. And I know Rod Serling, the legendary Rod Serling, was involved in the uh, in the adaptation for the film, the great Charlton Heston film. If you haven't seen the original Planet of the Apes, it's very, very amazing and striking because for its time, you know, it was pretty revolutionary and kind of this. Cr I mean, it was always a crazy idea of the you know the the, the apes being in charge, but the um, the makeup and the co speaking of costumes, you know, the ape stuff. Uh, I don't believe they officially, we talked about this before, they did not officially have a makeup category for the Oscars until years later, but it, it did win an honorary Oscar, a special Oscar for the makeup. You had these great actors like uh, Kim Hunter and Roddy McDowell playing the apes, and of course the great twist ending, if you haven't seen it, to the original Planet of the Apes with Charlton Heston. And then you had, uh, at one point, there was, I think, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, where the apes actually came to the United States. They were astronauts, and there's a great opening scene in that one. Because the the American space program and military says a ship has landed in our in our, in our waters. It it seems to be travelers from another planet, and then the the, the astronauts get out of this uh, this ship, this capsule, and they're apes. So that's you know there and there have been twists and turns. Um, 
they brought it back i think in 2001 tim burton kind of a standalone film not everybody loved it i thought it was kind of interesting and then we've had the recent uh reboot and remakes uh that kind of stand alone and obviously the technology has progressed now kingdom of, of the planet of the apes is a direct sequel to the most recent one from several years ago but it set several generations later after the death of caesar who is the mighty leader of the apes, right? So it's set in this undefined future, and we're now back to the point where the apes are evolved, and they can talk, and they can communicate, and they have communities, and the humans are feral and primitive and stinky and considered to be animals. So, you know, the tables are always turning between the humans and the apes. The humans are in charge. The apes are in charge. Sometimes the humans and the apes are trying to coexist, and that never works. And we always get a lot of metaphors about racism and gun control, climate change and weapons and police brutality all you know that that's always been a theme throughout uh the kingdom of the planet of the apes it's two hours and 25 minutes which is too long as are many of these movies i will say this though i am recommending it i'm giving it three stars out of four the visuals are unbelievable guys you know that combination of that footage where they where they shoot like in new zealand and all these incredible places. And then, of course, the motion capture, the CGI, the VFX, all of that stuff. It really is remarkable. Uh, I'm putting this in my print review. Imagine if you uh, were transported in time from 1924, where movies existed, and you, you know, you knew that, and all of a sudden you were plunked into a theater seat in 2024, and the movie that was playing was Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. I think you might believe that apes actually could talk in real life you wouldn't necessarily immediately say that's movie magic you'd be like holy shit i'm watching ape actors that's how realistic it is you i mean you buy into it and you get all these you know these actors who do owen teague is the new lead playing uh, noah who's the young hero of the story and they do such great work because we never see them uh, but they're there and then the human actors such as william h macy who's in this film as a human being uh, and others, um, uh, Frey Allen, uh, young actors, uh, they're interacting with people who then become the apes in post-production. And it's really quite an acting challenge. And I think we've come to appreciate that. The story, you know, the apes are, are battling each other. And then now, you know, there are different types of human clans and there's some twists and turns. But it's really mostly about the cool action. And this does set up um, a new trilogy. And I, I think they did a great job with it. It's a classic in terms of, and I mean, a classic film, but a classic summer film. You want to see it in that Dolby theater with the sound and everything and the great visuals. So that's out in theaters. Coming to television uh, is a great sports documentary series. It's called Full Court Press, and the timing couldn't be better for this. ESPN, uh, at the beginning of the 2023-2024 women's college basketball season, they embedded with three players, uh, Camila Cardoso, of uh, south carolina rice of ucla and caitlin clark of iowa uh three great talents three amazing and interesting and smart and really just wonderful young women who are true role models but they also come from very different backgrounds and they have very different stories going on throughout the season so this reminds me it's a four-parter it's going to be on abc and then it'll be streaming on espn plus in the next few days after this podcast uh, debuts uh it reminds me of shows like you know of course hbo's hard knocks where for years they they followed one particular football team and then netflix has done such a great job with formula one and full swing and quarterback you know the key to these documentary series is you get the cameras in on people who, yes, they're used to being in the public eye, but not used to being in front of cameras 24-7. Almost nobody is unless it's Kardashian. Uh, and you reach a level of comfort. I know some of the golfers who were in the in the in full swing talked about that. How at first it was like, geez, man. And then after a while, you do forget, or not really forget, but you get accustomed. You 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 get used to the cameras being with you. This is the key to reality television, going all the way back to the 90s. And, and uh, PBS shows and then early uh, hit shows like MTV's The Real World or even Survivor, especially in the early days when people didn't even know that much about what the shows were going to be about. The key is to get people to the point where they don't give a shit. You know, they're, they're, listen, you're always going to be aware of the cameras. And that's what they do here with these three main subjects and their families and friends and coaches and teammates and there's a lot of great espn journalists who are you know featured in this as well but you do get to the point where you feel like they're really 
letting us see the off the court side of life as a student athlete, as a as a woman college women's basketball star in by far the most listen there's been great college basketball on the women's side and pro for for many generations for for years now but this was a historic year and so espn was in the right place at the right time to capture this i think it's maybe my favorite sports documentary series since the last dance so check that out if you can let's end on that note thanks to everybody for tuning in i'm richard roper and we'll talk again soon